All right. Hi, everyone. Um, welcome to the fourth installment of IS4, the Indonesia Social Science Seminar Series. This virtual series brings together experts of Indonesia from all around the world to discuss pressing, pressing issues facing the country today. IS4 is sponsored by the Sydney Southeast Asia Center, the Cornell Southeast Asia Program, and the Royal Netherlands Institute of Southeast Asian and Caribbean Studies. I'm Sam Bazi. I'm an associate professor at the University of California, San Diego, and I'll be chairing this talk today. I'm absolutely delighted to welcome our speaker, Lisa Cameron, who is a professorial research fellow and director of the Disadvantage and Wellbeing in the Asia Pacific program at the Melbourne Institute of Applied Economic and Social Research at the University of Melbourne. She's a development economist with a unique uh, and longstanding interest and focus on Indonesia. And today we're fortunate enough to be hearing about her latest work, exploring the consequences of child marriage. Professor Cameron will present for about 10 to, or excuse me, 20 to 25 minutes. And then we'll hear from our discussant, Margaret Triana, um, for about 10 minutes. Maggie is currently an assistant professor at Wake Forest University. And in a few weeks, we'll be joining uh, the World Bank in the Sustainable Development Chief Economist's Office. After Maggie finishes, that'll leave about 20 minutes for Q&A, so please feel free to pop those questions into the Q&A box and I'll, uh, I'll, I'll field them to our speakers. And before we begin, I just wanted to acknowledge all of those uh, based in Indonesia at this difficult moment of the pandemic. Uh, we all very much hope that you and your loved ones are staying self safe and healthy. Um, so with that, I'm going to kick it over to uh, Professor Cameron to get us started. Thanks, Sam. Um, uh, thanks very much for inviting me uh, to speak today and thanks everyone for attending. So today I'm going to talk about the consequences of child marriage in Indonesia. And I just want to start by um, acknowledging my co-authors. So this is joint work with Diana Contreras Suarez, um, also at University of Melbourne, and Susanna Vichkiewicz, who was also at the University of Melbourne and has since moved on to a government job. Um, and it's a collaboration uh, between us at the Melbourne Institute and uh, MAMPU, which is Indonesia's Empowering Indonesian Women for Poverty Reduction um, Program. So I thought I'd just start by setting the scene and talk about the recent policy initiatives because there has been some quite significant change in terms of policy um, in relation to child marriage in Indonesia. The most significant change occurred in September 2019, where the legal age of marriage for women was raised from 16 to, 29, 16 to 19 years. Um, Indonesia also has um, placed targets for reducing child marriage in its national midterm development plan, with the uh, target of reducing the prevalence of child marriage from 11.2% percent to 8.7% by 2024. And there's also been a national strategy on the prevention of child marriage, um, which has been developed. So the first thing to note is that child marriage is very common in Indonesia. Um, about 25 million women or 29% of the current population of um, women in Indonesia were married before the age of 19. And also it doesn't just, although it's more prevalent among women, um, men also um, are married as children on, in some occasions. And um, so about 7 million men or 8.4% of Indonesian men um, were married before the age of 19. So what we do in this paper is we look at the consequences of child marriage, not just for women in Indonesia, but also for men. Um, and we're focusing on the consequences. There's been a lot of work on the drivers of child marriage, um, but, um, and that's interesting and important work, but we're examining the consequences of child marriage because it's important to understand the consequences when building a case for change. And it's important also in terms of motivating the implementation of the um, national law at the local level. So I'll start by talking about the data. So we use the Indonesian Family Life Survey. So this is a longitudinal survey of Indonesian households that's been conducted since 1993, um, five rounds of it through to 2014, and we use all rounds of the data. We also use the IFLS East. So the IFLS itself largely focuses on Western Indonesia, not exclusively, but largely. And IFLS East supplements that with data from the Eastern provinces of Indonesia to give a more representative picture of the country. 
Um, so we use information on individuals aged 18 and over. Um, we have a, a version of the paper that looks at um, individuals aged 19 and over. The results are very similar. Um, we're using age 18 in the, in the most recent version of the paper just because that aligns with the, um, the global definition of childhood in terms of being under 18 years of age. So in the final sample, we have about 40,800 individuals spread across 20 provinces and about 2,000 um, villages. Um, with about half in urban areas and half in rural areas. So, of course, the difficulty of trying to work out what the consequence of child marriage is, is that um, child marriage itself is associated with uh, characteristics like poverty, low levels of education. So the question is, does child marriage cause poverty and low levels of education, for example, or is it caused by poverty and low levels of education? And the, I think the answer is both those hold, but if you're trying to measure to what extent, how large the impact is, it's difficult trying to tease out those different mechanisms. And so what we do, we can't claim to have solved this. I mean, it's still a very descriptive paper. Um, but what we do is we estimate models where we're just looking at the, the difference between um, women and men who are married early and those who weren't. That's our base case. Then we estimate models where we add all the kind of um, controls or con control for confounding factors, as many as we can. So we include um, demographic variables, controls for socioeconomic status in childhood, things like father's education. And then we include uh, what we call village fixed effects, which effectively control for all of the, the uh, characteristics of the village in which the woman lives, uh, or Kalurahan in uh, urban areas. And, um, and so that controls for all of the, the kind of constant characteristics of those localities. So that means that we're actually being able to control for a lot of confounding factors. So we can be more confident that what we're identifying is the consequence of child marriage rather than just that something that's associated with child marriage more generally. And then in some specifications, we're able to go a step further and include sibling fixed effects. So what this means is that in effect, we're identifying the impact of child marriage off a comparison of sisters, if we're looking at women, sisters, um, so within one family, one of whom got married at a young age and the other one who didn't. And so that also kind of means that you're, you're effectively controlling for all of the household, the family characteristics, which are common between sisters when you're making that comparison. So we'll get jump straight into the results, starting first with education. So I'm going to present a series of um, figures that uh, illustrate the results. So if we look at the figure on the left, which is for women and for years of education, just to explain how you interpret these figures, the blue bar is telling you um, the average, in this case, years of education for women who weren't married um, under the age of 18. So you can see women who weren't married under the age of 18 in our sample have on average 10 years of education. Uh, now, the orange bar is the impact that we estimate um, the impact of child marriage. So um, in this instance, it's showing you that after controlling for other factors and where all these figures are done for the specifications with village fixed effects, so when we're comparing women within a village, um, after controlling for other factors, child's marriage reduces female educational attainment by an average of about 1.7 years. So the height of that orange bar is 1.7. So I guess the thing to do is focus on the orange bars because that shows you the impact of child marriage. Uh, if you look to the figure on the right, that's the figure for men, and you can see that the height of that orange bar is two. So you can see, again, men in our sample on average have just slightly less than 10 years of education, those men who weren't married at an early age. But those men who were married at an early age, having controlled for every, all, all the variables I discussed previously, so we can be somewhat confident that this is the um, impact of child marriage, they have two years less education, ending up with eight years of education on average. These results are strongly statistically significant. You can see those little bars, they're showing the, the, um, the standard errors of the estimate. 
um, and the results for women. So we only put it in um, sibling fixed effects for women. Uh, that's true throughout the paper. And the results remain strongly significant when you, we're using sibling fixed effects. So that means that if you have a sister um, who gets married early, if you compare her with her sister, on average, um, uh, she has less years of education than her sister who didn't get married at an early age. And in terms of education, this is not that surprising because um, having had discussions with the Ministry of Education in Indonesia, it seems that there's not a law that prohibits uh, individuals who are married from attending school, but in practice, that's what occurs. So if you're married, you effectively have to leave school. So you hence would expect to see a, um, a decrease in educational attainment. Next, we look at the labour market and employment of women and men. So this slide is for women. Um, you can see in the left-hand side, uh, figure, which is for labour force participation, which is effectively whether the woman works or not. The effect of child marriage is negative, but it's very small and it's actually statistically insignificant. So there's really no effect on average in terms of women's um, employment. Um, however, um, if we do in the paper, we look at this separately for urban and um, rural areas. And in urban areas, we do find that women who are married at an early age are six percentage points less likely to be working than women who weren't married at an early age. Where the bigger effects are is in the quality of work. So the next figure looks at the form, at formal sector employment. Uh, and you can see that um, women who are married at, a, as, at the, um, an early age or under the age of 18 are much less likely to work in the formal sector. That's 12 percentage points less likely or 35%. And in the third figure, they earn on average 24% less per hour than women who got married over the age of 18. And all of these results hold when we add sibling fixed effects. So you can see large effects on um, the quality of work um, associated with child marriage. The next figure is the same um, for men uh, and it similarly shows no effect on labour force participation. The effect is actually positive but again it's very small and insignificant but we see the same types of effects in terms of the quality of work that men who got married under the age of 18 are involved in. So again um, men who married earlier are about eight percentage points or 15 percent less likely to work in the formal sector and their income is about 21 percent lower, their hourly income about 21 percent lower than that of other men. We now go on to look at uh, divorce and family structure. The first thing to note is that women who married early are less likely to have a marriage certificate than other women. And also their children are significantly less likely to have a birth certificate. And these are just pieces of paper, but they're not just pieces of paper because they're actually important um, in that it's um, you need these kind of uh, certificates in order to get access to um, some forms of social protection payments. And also in some instances, children need a birth certificate to be able to be enrolled in school. Um, so these, these are effects that have large, um, um, potentially large consequences for the, the reality of people's lives. Um, child marriage increases the probability of divorce in the first marriage by about three percentage points. Um, although this effect does disappear once we include sibling effects. So that's when we're comparing the sisters. Um, in a lot of cases, when we add these sibling fixed effects, it really reduces our sample. And I had the numbers, but I've forgotten exactly what they are. But we go from a sample of thousands down to a sample of hundreds in some cases. So it's not surprising that when we add, when we're comparing sisters with each other, because we've got a lot smaller sample, it's not surprising that, that we lose um, statistical significance. But in a, most cases, the magnitude of the effect is very similar, which makes us quite quite confident that, the, that we are still picking up um, the effect of child marriage rather than just an association. Um, we also have information um, in the IFLS on uh, how decisions are made within the household. And interestingly, um, women who were married under the age of 18 report having less of a say in household decisions. Um, and this is true also once we're comparing within sisters. 
And you can see why that might be the case. If you're a young girl and you're being married to an older man, um, then that is likely to be somewhat disempowering and, um, and possibly give you less say about what goes on in your own household. Uh, now, turning to childbirth and prenatal care, we can see um, that younger brides are younger mothers. And so what I presented here in this figure is just the raw distribution of age at first birth, which I think is quite startling. You see there's a big shift to the right-hand side um, in terms of, so the blue figure is um, for those who were married over the age of 18. And you can see the age at first birth is significantly higher. It's about three years higher. So women who marry at a young age, on average have their children about three years earlier. That's a lot earlier. And they also have more children on average. It's about half a child more. Um, now we know that having more children, but and particularly having children at a younger age is a risk factor for maternal mortality. So we, we don't look at maternal mortality directly in the paper, but this, um, this suggests that early marriage has negative consequences in terms of uh, maternal mortality. There's also evidence that younger brides uh, have poorer prenatal care and poorer care during childbirth in that they're about seven percentage points less likely to have a blood test during pregnancy. They're also less likely to have a, a fetal heartbeat check and they're less likely to have had a medically supervised birth, uh, which also um, is associated with a higher risk of maternal mortality. So now if we look at, what, at the outcomes for children. So this is looking at the children of women who are married early. Then um, we also find adverse consequences. So if we look at stunting, we find that about, um, if you're the child of a woman who married under the age of 18, then you're about 16% more likely to be stunted. So that means very low height for age. Um, and also the, um, the IFLS conducts um, cognitive ability tests with respondents at certain ages. And because it's conducted over um, um, different waves of the survey, we're able to track children through. And when they're old enough to be given a cognitive um, ability test, we're able to look at how they score. And you can see that um, children of mothers who were married under the age of 18 perform worse on cognitive development tests. Um, 0.313 of a standard deviation worse. That's not a huge effect, but it is statistically, strongly statistically significant, suggesting that there is something there. Um, children of women who married early are also five percentage points less likely to be fully vaccinated. Now this I think is possibly the most interesting uh, slide or result from the paper. This is um, presenting results for a subjective, subjective well-being index. So respondents in the IFLS were asked a series of questions about um, their satisfaction with their family life, their standard of living for them and their children, food consumption, their health care and their children's education. Um, and so we plotted here for both men and women and um, what you can see as, is that we identify very large negative consequences of child mar marriage on people's subjective well-being. So on how they rate uh, their satisfaction with life. Uh, so that that's, um, I guess we, we view that as a, a kind of a, an overarching index of all these different characteristics that's the, that the woman and, and the men are experiencing as a result of being married at a young age. And this is how it affects how they feel about their lives. So these are large effects and they're significant and they hold with sibling fixed effects. When we first went to Indonesia at the very early stages of this project, we spoke to a lot of people who know um, a lot about child marriage in Indonesia. And we started to hear that people thought there were basically two kind of coarse categories of child marriage. The first is um, when uh, parents might marry a child, normally a daughter, off to an older man um, and because there are perceived economic benefits with, do with doing so. 
Um, but then there's also the case where you might have teenagers or boyfriend, boyfriends and girlfriends and parents become concerned about premarital sex and so they pressure the young couple to get married. And so those two types of child marriage seem to us to be quite distinct. So we're interested to look at whether the consequence of those two different types of child marriage um, differ. And so um, what we find is that when a girl under the age of 18 marries a boy under the age of 18, then that seems to exacerbate the uh, negative consequences of child marriage. Um, interestingly, we do find that in the case where the ages are more similar, um, the marriage is less likely to end in divorce. So possibly it's a happier marriage, um, possibly. <laughs> um, um, but um, in terms of the other outcomes, they're generally worse when you've got a boy, a young boy marrying a boy, a young girl. And you could see why that would be the case because that's going to comp compound like the, the effects of um, on labour market participation in terms of ability to um, uh, attain better quality employment, uh, which will affect earnings and so forth. Education of both spouses is negatively impacted. So we find that, um, that living in a household uh, where both the mother and the father or the husband and the wife are both married at a young age results in significantly lower per capita consumption than in the case where a young girl marries an older man. So um, what are the policy implications of these findings? So Indonesia has made a very good start by legislating to raise the legal age of marriage for women. Um, however, research shows that changes to laws are unlikely to be sufficient because people can circumvent laws, um, particularly in the Indonesian context. Um, families can go ahead with informal marriages, religious ceremonies and marriages without going through a civil marriage and the legal process. So it can be sidestepped in that respect. And there is a study in Mexico which shows that in Mexico where uh, when child marriage was outlawed or the age of child marriage was raised, then what happened is you did have fewer, a lot fewer um, marriages, legal marriages. We can't have a, <laughs> you couldn't have a legal marriage um, below the, the legal marriageable age. But there were a lot fewer um, couples um, getting married um, at very young ages. However, when they looked at other outcomes like teenage pregnancy and um, girls' education, they found no effect, which suggests that um, the change in the legal age actually wasn't changing people's behaviour. So that su suggests that additional measures are needed to support the legal changes. So let's look at what has been done elsewhere. Um, so in Uganda, um, there was a trial conducted of a program which provided girls with vocational skills to enable them to start small scale in income generating activities and also provided them with life skills so that they could make more informed decisions about sex, reproduction and marriage. Uh, and this was a randomised controlled trial. And four years after the program, it found that girls were, who participated were less likely to have been pregnant as a teenager, to have got married or be living with a partner. They aspired to get married at an older age. Uh, they aspired to start childbearing also at an older age. And they were more likely to be involved in income generating activities and to be able to provide for themselves. So that suggests that vocational training, and um, some kind of training or education about how to make informed decisions about marriage, premarital sex and so forth can be very effective. Um, so in the Indonesian context, uh, maybe we can discuss later what this could look like, but my understanding is that in Indonesia, there's very little in the, in the way of sex education in schools. And so that might be a good place to start. Um, basically any kind of discussion about um, choices and um, how to make informed decisions on these kind of issues um, is, um, has the potential to be effective. Another policy that has been tried elsewhere, this, in this case in Bangladesh, is um, financial incentives. 
this always strikes people as being a little bit odd, I think, because basically you're providing financial incentives for girls not to get married. So in this instance, the program provided unmarried 15-year-old girls with free cooking oil, which was a financial incentive, um, and they only received it if they remained single until age 18. Um, and interestingly, it was found to reduce the probability of child marriage by 23% and the probability of giving birth by... Um, by the age of 20. Um, and the girls who participated were also 24% more likely to be enrolled in education at the age of 24. So all large and very um, positive outcomes. So, um, you know, you could think about the in implementation of a program like that by kind of embedding um, remaining unmarried to a certain age in a kind of conditional cash transfer program. I mean, of course, there are would be major challenge. You'd have to work out something about how would you monitor that in practice and whether it's actually feasible. But I think um, the findings of this study show that it's, it's worth some consideration um, to see if you could come up with some kind of workable model. The third policy um, is information campaigns because child marriage is a cultural phenomenon. It's, um, it's uh, driven by social norms. Now, you know, so you look around you at what other people are doing uh, and you make your decisions taking that into account. Social norms are difficult to change, but they're not impossible to change. Um, and research has shown that they can, they can be influenced by direct information campaigns, be that through print media, TV, or these days, more commonly, social media. And there are things that can be done to make these kind of campaigns more effective. So um, they can be tailored to the local area, maybe in the, in the case of Indonesia, a district, um, and involving local leaders or social influencers has been found to be effective. Um, so this is an interesting area, I think, and an area um, where it's interesting to um, do more research. I'm actually hoping to be doing some research not directly related to um, social norms, in relation to child marriage, but social norms in relation to um, women's labour force participation, trying to uh, identify how you can most effectively change people's perceptions of social norms. Another thing that people can do um, that um, governments and uh, other organisations can do is that to um, try and reduce the negative impacts of child marriage. So, to try and reduce the negative impacts of child marriage more generally, the first thing you can try to do is to decrease the prevalence of child marriage, which is what the policies I've just discussed ha have dealt with. But then inevitably some women and men are going to end up being married at a young age. And so I think governments have a responsibility to try and uh, uh, offset the negative consequences of, um, of that uh, early marriage on the, um, the remaining lives of those individuals. And so just thinking about the consequences that we've identified, ways, policies that could um, ameliorate these negative consequences are policies that allow married women, um, married children to keep attending school, both boys and girls, I should say, because um, you can see in Indonesia this is, isn't the case. And they can provide, um, you can provide support to students with child um, with children. This has been done in other um, contexts. I know it's been found to be very successful in Australia, which is a very different cultural context, I know. But, um, you know, the provision of childcare at some schools to um, accommodate children, um, children who have children can enable um, these girls to um, continue with their schooling and so not adversely affect their trajectory um, through the rest of their lives. Um, policies that encourage young teenage mothers to attend prenatal uh, checks and access, and access medically supervised births um, would also offset some of those negative consequences. And finally, assistance for women who married early to obtain marriage certificates once they reach the legal age of marriage and also, also birth certificates for their children would then offset the negative consequences associated with not having those certificates later in life. So that is it from me. I um, very much look forward to receiving questions and having a discussion. Thanks very much, Lisa. Um, <clears throat> over to you, Maggie. Um, and while you're 
loading slides. Um, I just want to remind folks uh, in the audience to please enter questions in the Q&A box, and I will field those after Maggie's discussion. Thank you so much. Um, I really enjoyed the paper, Lisa. This, this was great. Um, there we go. Um, this was great. I, I think one of the things that I really appreciate about the paper is that you're not only looking at the women and, and their children, which I think has been the focus in the literature, um, but also looking at what are the impacts on, on men. Um, so just before I get there, I just thought it might be helpful to just think a little bit about how we could use the life cycle to, to think about the effects of child marriage as a shock, right? So uh, for the children of these women, we can think of this shock through uh, poor health care um, leading to child morbidity and mortality um, in, in utero and then at birth. And then beyond that, thinking about the possible malnutrition, possibly due to uh, limited household resources, uh, poor knowledge perhaps on the mother's part, um, leading to, to stunting, and we know the effects of, of stunting that it stays through adulthood. Um, and then um, leading into school age, uh, well, again, the limited resources might play into the possibility of the dropout leading to a lower school attainment. So that's sort of the children part. And now for the men and women, thinking about, you know, we know that uh, in, in terms of the characteristics of, of men and women who are likely to enter into child marriage, they are uh, ten, they tend to have lower education. And so thinking about low income for, for the household and uh, limited resources and how that affects uh, outcomes later on, whether that's health or, or labor market outcomes, including informality. And that's something that we care about so much just because it's lower productivity. Um, and then thinking about well-being, there's the subjective uh, well-being, uh, but also intimate, uh, intimate partner violence, which is a major, major concern, especially now with COVID. Um, and then uh, moving on into older age, in, into later life, there might be a death in the household and how that then affects uh, resources in, in the household and how that also potentially affects well-being. So with that in mind, I'm actually going to flip this a little bit by starting with the children and, and then going into the men and women. Um, so starting with the men and women, what's really, really nice with the IFLS, it's, it's a great data set, so rich, um, that, that this paper is able to get at beyond this association, right? Trying to get at the uh, causality uh, by looking at mother's characteristics when she was a child and including all of the different fix effects. Um, and consistently, we see poor outcomes for children. In terms of health, we know the height for HC score and, and also stunting, which is a big, big concern. And it's especially a concern in Indonesia because we know that there's this labor market premium uh, in adulthood. And so if you're stunted, you're a little bit shorter. And, and so it would be wonderful to project a little bit to see you know, what is the estimated productivity impact because the children are more likely to be stunted. This might also help boost uh, some of the efforts uh, for, for stunting reduction. And so if, if we could tie that together, that, that's sort of like killing two birds with one stone. Um, given the richness of the data, I'm wondering if it might be possible to use an index just so we have sort of a cleaner measure, um, but this is just obviously something that, that can be done. Um, and then uh, poor access to basic services uh, through the birth certificate and also the marriage certificate for the, for the, for the parents. Um, I think this is also uh, potentially important uh, in terms of access to uh, social protection. And I wonder if it might be possible to also look into that. Um, the poor cognitive skill and some evidence of lower education. Again, all of these, I think, can be sort of uh, tied together and, 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 and project a little bit in, in, in uh, productivity measure for the children. So these persistent poor outcomes are really concerning. Um, because we're thinking about the intergenerational transmission of human capital here. And so is there any evidence of this transmission of child marriage? Again, I understand that the sample size might be very limited because some of these children might be very, very young, um, but, but anything that could be done in, in that direction, I think will be very, very informative. Um, 
And uh, next on the men and women, um, again, the IFLS allows uh, the co-authors, uh, Lisa and co-authors to, to put in a lot of these fix effects. And it's really nice to be able to use the sibling fix effect with these sisters. Um, I understand sample size is an issue, but what's very reassuring is the uh, point estimates don't change much. And, and so we have some comfort with, you know, there, there's something causal here. It's, it's just a, a power issue um, in, in terms of the number of observations. Um, so overall, the poor well-being, I think, is something that's huge, right? It's not just for women, but it's also for men. Um, so, so certainly something important to, to highlight. And then for women, we see the uh, poor health outcomes, both on the underweight and overweight. And so we're thinking about um, the, the potential consequences of uh, these health effects now in, into older ages, that that's uh, certainly something that's potentially costly um, on, on health expenditure. And then for men, again, the informality is really concerning given the productivity of, of the informal sector um, and, and the lower per capita expenditure if we're thinking about um, the household as, as a whole. Um, and thinking about the types of, of child marriage, and this is something that I find super interesting. Um, if both spouses married early, it seems to be really, really uh, a, a concern. Um, what I'm wondering is, you know, are there cutoffs in terms of how early that is? Um, and then the other thing is, um, this is purely anecdotal. This is just from conversations with uh, some, some, some people in, in mostly rural Indonesia. Um, there seems to be this, uh, you know, they have to get married because she's already pregnant. And I don't know if it might be possible to check in the IFLS um, in, in, in terms of the timing for this kind of, uh, of marriages where both partners are, are young. Um, and then on the um, one, one child and, and one adult, how important is that age difference? This is something that I think you know, there might be something there, but, but I'm not entirely sure what that might look like in, in the context of, of Indonesia. So I, I really enjoyed this paper. And I think thinking about the policy is, is the part where sort of the real work has to really come in. Um, so changing the law is really important. It's obviously an important first step. But as you mentioned, Lisa, the enforcement is the big question, right? How do we get around the um, uh, the, the, not the civil marriage, but just the religious marriage. And, and so I think it comes down to, to social norms. Um, and then that might be where we could think a little bit more about what that uh, intervention might look like. For the financial incentives, um, the paper mentioned the conditional cash transfer program. So the PKH has the family development session. And I wonder if that might be one opportunity where a module could be developed to target this in places where we know that it's an issue. Um, one of the issues with the family development session is that there are so many modules, right? So how do we tease out, you know, at, at what point should this be brought up and who should be targeted? Um, but if that can be incorporated, I think that that's potentially very promising. Um, and on the behavioral interventions, the role of the community is really important. So how do we change social norms? I'm just thinking a little bit about how there are some early childhood programs out there that can be adapted to local context. I wonder if there might be something there for child marriage where you have sort of this best practices that can then be adopted um, into local culture. So, you know, make it as local as possible so that um, people can really see why this is an issue. Um, but beyond that, they can also um, essentially prevent the, the, uh, child marriage from within the community. And then obviously, you know, a lot of this is, is, is for prevention, but we cannot forget the people who are already experiencing child marriage, right? Um, and, and so one thing is interventions that allow the next generation to catch up. And I think it's not just about investing in the children, but also potentially investing in the household right now, um, whether that's through the cash transfer program or, or other sort of uh, family uh, type, uh, family-based uh, programs. So let me stop there. Thank you so much. This, this is a wonderful paper. Great. Thank you so much, Maggie. Um, Lisa, do you want to take a moment to reply or uh, uh, to, to what Maggie uh, put forward? Yeah, that'd be great. Thanks very much, Maggie. Um, that was very useful. Um, yeah, I think um, you suggested um, other outcomes we could look at. I mean, I think... Uh, 
that that will all be worth doing, particularly access to social protection. We hadn't thought of doing that and we could probably do that. Child marriage, yes, it would depend on the sample sizes. And even though you start in the IFLS, you start with a very large sample. By the time you cut it down, you, I'm always surprised at how few observations you end up with the end, at the end. So I'm not sure if that would be possible or not. Um, we did try looking, when we were doing the research, we did try looking at age differences between the um, husband and the wife to see if we could kind of identify a particular age gap that was problematic. And um, also, you know, well, we had discussions about looking at whether is it marriage at 16 versus marriage at 18 that's really problematic or, you know, but but again, once you go down to those very early, like, you know, where, where you would really be very seriously concerned about, a, you know, a child getting married at age 15, there are just very few observations in the data, possibly because people don't want to report it and also just because of the, the underlying sample sizes. Um, the Pekaha Family Development Session, I think, yeah, well, I guess... <laughs> there's a lot in there and often you know even just in my own research I always think oh you can put that in the Pekaha development sessions um I think this though child marriage is one that it's so it's such a family issue you know I would like to see it in there but um whether that's feasible or not I don't know and uh, I think looking at, at information campaigns that have been done elsewhere um, in the developing world on child marriage is a, a really good idea um, that um and I, I just don't know myself but um it'd be interesting to find out so thank you Great, thanks. Um, so there are a couple of questions in the Q&A box and folks, please feel free to add, uh, add others uh, as we go. Um, the first one's from Tom Papinski at Cornell, um, who uh, like um, several of us, I think fi finds the sibling fix of X quite convincing, um, but wonders about birth order and whether, um, you know, how much of this might be uh, sort of confounded by birth order differences and whether you've thought about um, controlling for that. Uh, in any way. Um, and a related uh, uh, question about this, the sort of uh, uh, specification, um, also from Tom, uh, asking about sort of how uh, uh, discontinuous the effects are uh, around the 18 cutoff and whether there's, uh, you know, whether you can do something more flexibly to look at under 18 versus 18 to 20, 22 to 24, and so on, and sort of if there's any anything sort of magical happening at 18, or if there's, it, it just looks a lot smoother. Uh, thanks for those questions. Um, so I'll deal with the second one first. So that's about the discontinuities around age 18. We haven't, I think we did play around that very early on. We have, as I mentioned, two versions of the paper, one that looks at marriage under the age of 19 to align with the new Indonesian laws, and another one that has it looks at marriage under the age of 18. And the results are very similar. You that you have we find more strongly significant effects in the under 19, just because if you look at those who are married under the age of 19, you've got a bigger sample, particularly when you look at the sibling fixed effects and when you look at young women marrying young boys, the results look very similar across the different specifications, but they're more statistically significant once we include um, those who are married at age 19. Um, so I can't say much more than that. I do think it, it, is interest, it is interesting to, it would be interesting to do something where you do like I'm imagining some kind of um, non-parametric graph that's looking for discontinuities or something along those lines, but we just haven't done that at this stage. Um, on birth order, we did think about birth order and I'm not, we did think about it. We've thought about so many things and we tried so many things. So I'm not sure that we actually tried putting birth order in. It's possible that we did, but we do control for age. So age does, so you are, so we do have controls in there for, for if one sibling's older than the other and um, by how much. So that would deal with that issue, at least in part. Thanks. Um, Tamara Magal from uh, the Institute for Sustainable Futures at UTS asks, um, 
about uh, possible strategies for mitigating the negative consequences of child marriage and when you, whether you've identified specific enablers or barriers um, in you know, the cultural, religious, or political domains um, and sort of how to, how to think about, about those sort of specific uh, um, you know, uh, uh, possibilities for, for mitigating some of these consequences. We haven't done as much as we would have liked um, looking at those kind of factors. When we first went to Indonesia and lots of conversations with people about child marriage, we did think we'd look at that, try and look at that in more detail. And that's probably an area where um, people other than ourselves can, can um, make um, more significant contributions. But, you know, when we did go to Indonesia and we had the conversations with various organisations, there was a lot of discussion about how um, child marriage differs across different contexts within Indonesia and, you know, it's more prevalent in some places than others and the nature of it in some places than in others. And so we did go away with a list of places that we thought we'd, we'd like to look at specifically. However, um, we did do a little bit of work on that and we, because we tried we thought oh maybe we could look at this province by province but even when you do it province by province the sample size has just be, become small enough to make everything quite noisy and then it really just ends up looking like a bit of a mess so so we backed away from that approach so we haven't done very much about that other than in just talking about the prevalence different prevalences of child marriage across Indonesia um, but what was interesting when you look well, when you look at the prevalence of child marriage across Indonesia, it's high in a lot of places. Um, Sulawesi Tenggara is the um, the the province in Indonesia in the IFLS because not all provinces are in the IFLS. So you have to keep that in mind. Um, but it has the highest prevalence for both men and women of child marriage in the IFLS sample. And then West Papua and Papua. But then even um, I think Lampung, South Sumatra, East Kalimantan, South Kalimantan, and all across Java too, outside the big cities um, and outside Jogja. <laughs> Jogja is always a special case. So, um, uh, yeah, so it is, you know, prevalent across the country, but we do understand that the nature of it differs. We just can't really get at that very effectively with our data. Thanks. Um, let me ask a related sort of clarifying question. So um, in, in religious courts, in the Islamic courts, is it possible to marry under the, uh, the, the legal, new legal age? Uh, now, I know, um, my understanding is, and please, if anyone knows better than I do, let me, you know, chip in, but my understanding is that there, you can still appeal to local religious leaders to get permission mm -hmm. for a marriage. And my, and my understanding is that that was the case prior to the, the change of the legislation. My understanding is that that is still the case. Yes, so it is possible to circumvent it. So, so a lot of, you know, how effective would this change in the law be? A lot of that does depend on how it's implemented, and and the um, programs that is, that um, accompany um, implementation at the district level. Yeah, thanks. Um, there's a question from uh, Rungren uh, Pratipornkul. Um, who is noting that um, in certain parts of uh, uh, Southern Thailand, uh, where there's large Muslim populations, um, there's a norm of encouraging daughters to marry younger um, in order to uh, signal to um, the community that you, you know, you're not uh, uh, preventing your daughter from growing up and sort of becoming a, an independent woman. Um, and wonders if there are similar sort of local cultural norms that might be at play in, uh, in the Indonesian context. Um, I, I really don't know very much about that. One thing I would say, though, that while the prevalence of child marriage is highest amongst Muslims in Indonesia, it's also quite, it's, it's not a lot higher than among other groups. Um, from recollection, it's still quite high amongst, uh, uh, amongst Catholics, um, slightly lower amongst Protestants. So it's not purely a, um, you know, a lot of this is driven, some of it is driven by cultural factors, other and religious factors, and but a lot of it's also driven by economic factors and, um, you know, the need for people to um, 
uh, be able to look after their family, which might involve um, getting one child off their hands, um, sadly. Um, we did try and look at that because I, I am unconvinced that getting that marrying off a, a, a young girl, say, has positive impacts, um, economic impacts on the household. And that was something we wanted to look at to see. I mean, there might be that perception, but is that actually the case? But we weren't able to, um, at least in the time we had while we we're focusing on, on, um, on this paper, to really get a good, clean look at that question. But I think that's something that would be really uh, interesting in looking at more closely. Yeah, I mean, you could even imagine the benefits being very direct for uh, the younger siblings that are still in the household, mm. right? Um, like opportunity, you know, freeing up resources for the parents to invest more directly in the you know remaining children's health or education. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah, but I, yeah, I mean, it may be the case, but I was also thinking it may be the case that that parents marry off a, a young child to an older man, thinking that. Um, well, that might free up resources in the household, but they might also think that he has a certain earning capacity and that might flow back to them. And, and look, and you see right. whether that actually happens commonly or not would be something worth investigating. Yeah. Um, so, um, yeah, there's a question about, um, from Cheyenne Osterich, um about the extent to which family debt um, thinking a bit about some of the, I guess, going back to the causes or determinants of child marriage, um, you know, how, how important family debt might be for, for shaping that decision. Um, and I guess in thinking about this, it, it relates to sort of a bigger question that I have. Um, I think it's great that you're thinking a lot about the consequences, um, because there is sort of this, uh, you know, a, a lot of work on the causes and determinants, but I wonder if different causes of child marriage have different consequences. Um, and I wonder, you know, the extent to which, um, you know, you, you've thought about that or um, like for one example, I mean, I imagine a lot of the child marriages are arranged marriages, but I don't know if this is, you know, if it's, if all of them are, um, but if the ones that aren't arranged are somehow, uh, um, uh, you know, a conducive to, to happier marriages, potentially better outcomes, um, thinking a bit about that. Uh, so family debt, we haven't looked at explicitly, but there is a literature showing that um, times of economic hardship are associated with higher rates of, uh, of child marriage. So I would expect that that is the case, that if a, if a house is experiencing economic hardship, which can be, you know, result in family debt, then yes, they're more likely to be looking around uh, for um for a way to um, relieve their economic burden, which might involve marrying a child. Um, but that isn't, I mean, that is something, well, in the IFLS, you can construct measures of debt. I'm not sure how, well, there are some indicators. So that would be something that it, it might be worth um, and interesting to look at, yeah. Um, in terms of different causes of child marriage having different consequences, our main focus, in looking at that was like looking at the the you know when the young girl marries a young boy versus the young girl marrying the older man in that they're kind of different types of marriages and and, and um my expectation would be that um that the arranged marriages are more likely to they're more likely to be to the older man whereas the young marriages are more to do with girlfriends and boyfriends and 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 maybe and parental pressure but that relationship's all, all already been formed um, and so, you know, we, we can see, well, it was interesting seeing the different divorce rate um, and the fact that, that the younger couple are more likely to stay together, um, which we, um, you know, the group of authors all looked at that and thought, oh, that means that they're happier marriages. I mean, that's really far from clear, isn't it? Maybe they just don't have other, other options or so, and it's hard to get at that with quantitative data, but qualitative studies on that would be really interesting. Um, you know, I think there's scope for looking at this question of economic shocks and the impact that has on the consequences because could people have looked at the effect of economic shocks on the prevalence of child marriage. Looking at the effect of economic shocks on the consequences of child marriage it would be taking that a step further and I think that would be really interesting. Um, I'm not sure what I would expect to, it's hard to know what, you know, what you'd expect to see there, but it'd be interesting to look. Sure. Um... 
And so uh, another clarifying question, I think you mentioned something about a sort of uh, um, differences across uh, religious groups in terms of child marriage rates, but there's a question about just sort of the, the basic difference between Christian and Muslim Indonesians in terms of the rates. Well, if I, <laughs> the only way I can answer that question is beyond saying what I've already said, which I know that they're all quite high. And I do remember um, that it was, I think it was lowest for Protestant Indonesians, um, but it is in our paper. So it, um, uh, if, if anyone's interested in looking at the paper, um, uh, just email me and I can send it to you. I could find it now, but I think that's probably not the best use of our time. <laughs> yeah, sure. Um, so let me ask um, let me ask another question, thinking a bit about what's happening inside the household in terms of the um, empowerment or disempowerment of uh, of these these uh, young uh, women in particular. Um, is there have you thought a bit any if there's anything sort of uh, a role to play for the in, the in-laws and if there's like child marriages are more likely to have an older mother-in-law um, thinking about girls in particular um, and whether sort of relations with the mother-in-law um, are different and the mother-in-law is playing more of a role um, you know whether it be good or bad um, just yeah I, I, it, it's something that came to mind and I don't I, I presume you have the data to kind of look at these extended family sort of cohabitation and, and, and that sort of thing um, yeah so we could look at so you can you can even if a couple doesn't live with their parents or their spouse's parents, you can still in the IFLS, there are modules that ask questions about non-co-residing parents of respondents. So um, it would be possible to look at something along those lines. Try, I know that in previous research, I have looked, I've thought a lot about this issue and I, and I, I think it's something that's really, would be very interesting to look at. And I have looked about, at it in one context, but I'm just struggling to recall how I did that with the, da, with the data and whether it was with the IFLS. Um, I think particularly in relation to um, childcare during, um, medical care during childbirth, mothers-in-laws are known to play a large role. Um, the one interesting thing that I didn't mention in the talk that um, is related to this is that women who married under the age of 18 did report having less say in household decision-making. But interestingly, men who married under the age of 18 also reported having less say in household decision-making. So that's presumably that's um, they're still marrying someone, you know, young, and they're both reporting they're having less say in household decision making, which does suggest that the parents or the parents in laws or somebody else in that household is having the say. So it's not it, the questions are about whether you have a say. It's not that that you're the person who makes those decisions. So it's just the ability to contribute to those decisions. But it was interesting that that affected both men and women roughly equally. Great. Um, so I think we're uh, we're just about um, out of time. Um, there are a couple of other questions in the Q and A. Um, uh, let me just ask one more and quickly go through that uh, from Michelle Ford. Um, do you have any insights into whether young couples um, tend to live with uh, which set of parents? Um, are they more likely to live with the, the the husband or the wife's parents, and whether that might shape outcomes for the couples? Hi, Michelle. Um, we do have, we could work that out. We haven't looked at that. And I think that's a great idea because um, you could clearly identify that. So you could look at consequences for couples who live um, by themselves, couples that live with the, the wife's parents and couples that live with the, um, the husband's parents. And you could also kind of look at how that varies with whether the, you know, it was the boy or the girl who was married at a young age or both. Um, I think that would be really interesting, but unfortunately I don't have any <laughs> anything to say on that at this stage. 
Great, thank you so much, Lisa. Uh, this was really great. Um, Maggie, thank you for your discussion. Thank all of you for uh, attending. Um, join us again uh, next month um, at the end of September on uh, Thursday, uh, the 30th of September. Um, we'll have a, a presentation by Professor Emeritus Hank Schultz Nordholt, um, who will be telling us about um, colonial history uh, in Indonesia uh, with Professor Bambang Porwanto uh, serving as a discussant. So please do join us again uh, next month. And in the meantime, uh, everyone stay safe, healthy, and, um, uh, and take good care. Thank you very much. Thanks, everyone.